and hopefully without doing any damage to Lawrence's lesson that he just preached and will preach again in an hour, um, we will be studying this morning from Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, a pivotal passage in the letter that Paul wrote to the Galatians. And the subtitles that... Uh, that I've given to this, these are, and yet these are from the scripture that itself, stand firm in your freedom and keep step with the spirit. I think those are really the topics of Galatians chapter 5. So to begin, Paul tells them, you are free. Free from what? Free from the law of Moses and its encumbrances. Set free by whom? By Christ himself. Why were we set free? Simply because he wanted us to be free. For freedom, Christ has set you free. What did Jesus say in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32? If you abide in my word, then you're my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. One of the main goals of Jesus coming to earth was to set people free. The Jews had become bound under law, and under the hedges around the law that the religious elite had, had set up in addition to the law. They were so bound by this law that they didn't think they could be obedient to God anymore. They didn't think that they could be pleasing to God. And they didn't realize the, their loss from Abraham who was pleasing to God by faith. The law had become so elaborate and so demanding and the additions to the law had become so demanding upon them that they, by and large, the people, the sinner class, as the Pharisees termed them, didn't think they could be pleasing to God and only the Pharisees could be. Jesus came to set them free. Why? Simply because that's a basic element of what God wants for his people. He wants them to be free. What is our duty then, in verse 1, to stand firm in that freedom and do not submit again to bondage? That's what Paul told those people who were having these laws reimposed upon them after Christ had set them free. He said, your duty then is to stand firm in the freedom and do not submit again to bondage. You see all that in verse 1? Don't let me put words in Paul's mouth. I think that's what it says. So then... The very advantage of Christ, he says in verse 2, is to free us from the rigors of law. What, What advantage is there in Christ if not to set us free from the rigors of law? If you're relying on any part of the law to save you, he says in verse 3, you're obligated to all of it. You are cut off from Christ You have fallen away from grace, verse 4. Our hope of becoming as we ought to be, that is, our hope of becoming righteous, in verse 5, depends upon faith, and it's brought about through the Spirit. You see that in verse 5? What if we accept this bondage that's being imposed upon us by these Judaizing teachers. Look back at verse 2 again. Christ is of no advantage to you. We are obligated to keep the whole law. There's no stopping this. 
If you accept the circumcision, then why not by extension accept the animal sacrifices? And if you accept the animal sacrifices, then why not accept the feast days? And if you accept the feast days, and why not? And you can see how this is going to grow and grow and grow until Christians are not only obligated to keep circumcision, they're obligated to keep the whole law. Because don't you know that's the nature of law? That if you're bound to law, that you're bound to keep all of it. And he says, in verse 4, you're severed from Christ. Wow, that's stark. You have fallen away from grace. These are some of the harshest words you'll read in all of Paul's writings. And what are they unleashed against? They're unleashed against a system that portends to be the gospel, but is actually the gospel superimposed upon it, the law of Moses. He says, you are hindered, in verse 7, from obeying the truth. The law of Moses being imposed upon the gospel hinders us from obeying the truth. What's the truth? The truth is, We obtain our righteousness not by law keeping, but through faith in Christ and being motivated by faith in Christ to then render obedience to our Lord. That's the truth. But if we impose upon that all the laws of Moses, then it detracts something, doesn't it? Not just something, it detracts everything from the freedom that we experience from being in Christ and from operating under grace and through faith and just trying to live in humble obedience to the Lord. It's an obstacle to that kind of obedience. So Paul is putting the thumbscrews on him here, and you can feel him tighten in verse 2. Christ is no advantage to you. Verse 3, obligated to keep the whole law. Verse 4, severed from Christ, fallen from grace, hindered from the truth. That's the condition The moment you begin to accept law, in this case the law of Moses, in place of freedom to obey according to faith. What's the harm in it? Verse 8. This way of thinking is not from Christ. Verse 9, it's a leaven that spreads. In our vernacular, it's a slippery slope. When you start accepting the law of Moses, you're on a slippery slope because it just accumulates. Let me show you something that will help to illustrate this, I hope. This is the U.S. Federal Register number of pages when it first was uh, compiled in 1936 until 2020. Once you begin compiling laws to correct behavior or to try to improve on society, where's the end to that? It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what had happened to the law of Moses. And it's what happened to the the Talmud in addition to the law of Moses. It just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger until somebody had to finally say, let's just put a cap on this thing. Well, in the U.S., we haven't found the cap yet. We're still growing our law. And it turns out that amassing all these laws... Laws upon laws upon laws doesn't do anything for people above what obeying 10 simple commandments would have done for them. If they had understood the intent and if they had been walking by faith. It troubles He says in verse 10, those who are walking by faith. The one who imposes law will bear his penalty, he says. 
This is something that's punishable. It's, it's damnable. This will condemn you. And he goes on. Verse 11. Freedom in Christ is offensive to those who love law and abandon grace. There are religious leaders who gained their power, actually, through imposing laws on other people. And they reinforced that power through doing so. The Pharisees were a case in point. The more the Pharisees could impose additional law, a hedge around the law on people who were living under the law, the more difficult that they could, they could make it for other people to keep the law. Don't you see how, as legal experts, that raises them above the other people and makes the other people subservient to them? It benef benefited no one more than it did the Pharisees who were amassing the laws. This is a general truth. People who are in power and who love power gain additional power by imposing additional rules. And it even gives you greater power if you're the only one who has the right to, has the power to interpret those rules for everyone else. And so people who are in power very often hate the idea of people just having freedom. It's loss of power. So, if, you, if one question is, why did Jesus feel, why was Jesus such a threat to the Pharisees and the scribes? There's your answer. He set people free from the very encumbrance that were encumbrances that were imposed by those scribes and Pharisees. So he says, use your freedom from circumcision, that is, not as a way of serving yourself, fleshly motives such as anger, gossip, power grab, faction, saying hurtful things. I'm free and I'm going to rub your nose in it. I'm free and in your face, buddy. No, that's not the attitude that we have. We don't use this for fleshly motives, but as a way of serving others. Now, there's a challenge for all of us who have been made free, isn't it? He's on one hand, on, on one hand, very heavily uh, coming down on those who are imposing the laws, and yet on the other, he doesn't just let everybody else off the hook and say, okay, you guys are just free. You go and, and uh, just exercise your freedom and shake your fist at the guy who's trying to impose these laws upon you. No, he says, don't use it as a way to, to advance yourself. Don't use it as a way of serving the flesh, but instead as a way, use your freedom as a way to serve others. And Paul must have gotten the sense that there was a ruckus, to use a technical term, um, because he'll go on to talk about the same kinds of remedies for division that he talked about throughout the first letter to the Corinthians. So, 5, 1 through 15, you are free. The law, especially as practiced and enforced by the Pharisees, was heavy and burdensome. Christ has set us free from the law and by extension, from all human legal encumbrances. Did you catch that? Don't let, this is maybe a slight sleight of hand, but not much, because we're going to go back and read a verse in a minute. We become joined to Christ. You know, if there was a law who's, that was going to be good for people, to make them better people, the law of Moses surely would have done it. But Paul said there's not. The, the law of Moses wouldn't do it. Law is incapable of doing it. So other laws that might be imposed are certainly not going to do any better job than the law that was imposed by Moses. The fact is, law can't make you righteous. It can only convict you. You've been made free from the law by Christ. Don't become encumbered again to the law of Moses or to any other system of law that might come around to try to replace it. <clears throat> 
we have become instead joined to Christ. Divorced from the law, actually dead to the law, it would probably be the way that Paul put that in, in Romans chapter 7, wasn't it? Dead to the law, and so free to be bound only to Christ, to be joined to Christ. And what did Jesus say? He didn't come to bind people hand and foot. He came to set them free. To give them rest. Not to be harsh, but to be gentle. Not to be, to raise himself up in pride, but to be lowly. To give rest to our souls. There is a yoke, but it's easy. There's a burden, but it's light. What questions or comments do you have about what we've covered so far? Stunned silence. So then, if we're not bound by law, how are we going to live? How are we going to know what to do? How are we going to know what not to do? Galatians 5, beginning with verse 16, gives us the alternative to walking according to law. <clears throat> he begins by saying in verse 16, walk by the Spirit and you won't live for fleshly gratification. If you're living for fle fleshly gratification, perhaps it's not because it's not that you need more law imposed upon you. You don't need someone with a hammer over your head to make you do the right thing. Maybe what you need to do is focus more on the things of the Spirit and less on the things of the flesh. That's the remedy Paul offers for the problem of how then shall we live. We'll live according to the Spirit. Well, what does that mean? It means if we focus on the things of the Spirit, as he says in Colossians, where Christ is seated on the right hand, at the right hand of God, if you've died to a former life and you're living a new kind of life, and you're focused on that new kind of life, then fleshly gratification won't be at the top of your menu anymore. It'll get pushed further down. Now your flesh is still going to scream at you from time to time. And the Spirit will whisper to you. And you have to pay attention to the whispering of the Spirit or the flesh will get all your attention. But Paul says that if you pay attention to the things of the Spirit, you won't go about trying to gratify the desires of the flesh. And that's a constant challenge before every one of us. Every one of us. He says in verse 17 that the flesh and the spirit are enemies. Does this sound anything like what we read back in Romans chapter 7 and 8? That if you, that living according to the flesh is enmity with God. That there's this battle that goes on inside of us. The flesh against the spirit. And sometimes we do the things we don't want to do. What's the remedy to that? Again, in, Paul, in Romans 8, 7 and 8, Paul said the remedy to that is walking according to the spirit. While, rather than walk, walking according to the desires of the flesh. That's the challenge that we constantly have before us when we're free in Christ. It's freedom not to live as we want, to live to be more and more pleasing to God 
That's different from law, isn't it? Isn't that different from having somebody saying, do this and don't do that? It's saying, I'm going to do this because of what he did for me. I'm not going to do that because it will despoil my relationship with him. Very different. And yet, superficially, it could look the same. But as we just saw in those first verses, it's, very, it's a de- very different way of thinking. Because one is ultimate freedom. It keeps us from being bound to law, but it also keeps us from being bound up by our sins and bound up in a confusing, uh, um, imprisoning life. <clears throat> Led by the Spirit means not under law, verse 18. He argues in verses 19 through 23 that if we're led by the Spirit, we'll depart from immorality and character failure and bear the fruit of the Spirit. Now, you wanna, if you want a law to live by, if you want a checklist to live by, try checking off all these boxes, will you? The fruit of the Spirit is love. To love the way God loved, to love the way that Jesus loved. The fruit of the Spirit is joy, to living a joyful life because of your connection with God and His Spirit. If you're living a joyful life, where is your joy coming from? Is it coming from the things that you possess? Is it coming from your status, your position, your wealth, your family, your job? Where does your joy come from? Or is your joy connected to your connection to God? Is it because the Spirit of God is in you? Is it because of your fellowship with God? What's the source of your joy? Peace. Is it because we're not at war? Is it because we're not fighting? Where does your sense of peace come from? How long are you willing to suffer? You see, these are the, the kinds of character traits that indicate a connection to the Spirit of God. And there's no end to that either. It's rather open-ended, isn't it? How much can you love? How much more can you be like Christ? How much more peaceful and joyful can you be? How much more long-suffering can you be? How much more gentle can you be? Those are kind of open-ended sorts of things. But do you see how freeing that is? as opposed to a do this, don't do that kind of mentality. We're not bound up under law. We're bound in a different way. We're joined to Christ. And being joined to Christ means being led by the Spirit. And it means being willing to be transformed by the Spirit of God into something different than what we are, something better than we are. Now we're, we're no longer comparing ourselves with other people in regards to how well we keep the law. Now we're comparing ourselves to what we have been and to what we could be. Do you see how much better that is? We're not comparing ourselves to each other. We're saying, I could, I could do better, man. <laughs> I could do a lot better. I'm doing better about this than I was a year ago, but man, I could do better. And so we're being led higher and higher and higher by the Spirit of God. That pressure that God gently places on on us, it's different from the kind of pressure that we receive from oftentimes from other people and from religious leaders. It's different from the kind of pressure the Pharisees and the scribes put on the people 
It's the spirit of grace. And he says the reason we do this in verse 24 is because we've crucified the flesh. Let's take a break here and see if you all have any comments. What are you thinking? Carrie. You look at the things he describes as the fruits of the Spirit. It's amazing how difficult it is to take those things and transform them into the shape of rules and regulations. (laughs) Carrie says it's difficult to take the fruits of the Spirit and transform them into rules and regulations. And that's true. It's a different way of thinking, different system. It might be a little easier to take the works of the flesh, which he says are obvious, and he lists them, and make don'ts out of those. Um, But don't be angry. That's a tough one. Um, You know, there are some, even those that can be easily made into don'ts, if you take them as they're written, they're transformative, aren't they? What else? Gene? I like uh, this in verse 14 where he says that the whole thing is bound up in love your neighbor uh, as yourself. And Jesus, of course, instructs his apostles who every now and then say something about who's the greatest, whatever. And he gets fairly rough with them. Yeah going to get it. I can't give you greatness. You will be a slave to your fellow man if you wish to be great in the kingdom. And so it's, it's repeated here in what Paul is saying. Uh, let these things get away. You have to love your uh, fellow. You can't uh, just say, well, uh, you're doing okay, but you can do better here. Well, that's fine, but you only say you can do better here because you love, or I love you, or you love me. And so I, I, I think you could do better. You seem to be stepping in the wrong place. And so Paul just says, this is it. Now, it's hard to do, but this is the sum total. This is what Jesus said and Paul is saying. Okay, for those of you who can't hear, Gene is pointing out the connection between the teaching of Paul here and the teaching of Jesus when Jesus referenced the law being fulfilled in two commandments, really, loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. And Paul using those same words here and saying all this can be summed up in love for one another. Um, Jesus said, on these two laws hang all of the law and the commandments. Everything that was said in the law and the commandments, in other words, could be accomplished if we just learn to love God and love other people. Uh, A lot of these other laws and commandments would take care of themselves. And and, and, uh, Gene rightly points out that Paul is saying the same thing here. And it's hard to do, isn't it? As as much as it's freeing, it's also hard to love people that way. It's hard to love God that much to where it transforms who you actually are. It actually transforms your being into something from, from who you are now to something that you'll become later. <clears throat> but if that transformation is not taking place in us, then we're not uh, keeping step with the Spirit as Paul will mention um, Floyd. I was uh, admiring the word here where you said in verse 1 and 7 and 16 to stand and ran and walk think of those bodily poisons and how they relate to this. He says stand in the liberty and the whole idea is that you're, you're about to depart from it and you're making a mistake and that was verse 1 and verse 7 he says you ran well and we see that they were running the wrong direction so you, you know ran is past tense and then finally in verse 16 he says walk in the spirit and so it kind of like summarizes a lot of what they were going through you know you need to stand firm in this liberty uh, because you're you're heading the wrong way you need to stop running the wrong direction you ran well until you didn't and then walk now in the spirit 
Okay, that's, that's an interesting way to break it down, isn't it? He, uh, to stand in your liberty, you were running well, so run well again, and now walk according to the Spirit. Very good. Three different postures, but all meaningful in our relationship with Christ. Ben. It's not about where you are now, but it's about following as to, to grow. And I think that that is one of the biggest contrasts of the system of law versus the system of the spirit, is that the system of the spirit is always, your, it's constant growth. It's constant rejuvenation and renewal and constant, um, you know, the more God's spirit is in you, the more you become like him. And there is so much hope in that. There's so much freedom and beauty in that. There's so much, it's all open. It's not, there's nothing closed about it. Whereas the law is about, well, right now, am I able to do this or am I not? Have I done this actually or have I not? And there is no freedom in that. Obviously, it's clearly just a, it's a, a restriction and a binding. And being led by the Spirit is such a perfect answer to that. I think you put that well. It, was just, it struck me as you said that. Great. Thank you. Ben was, was reiterating the point that law is binding by its nature. It's a limit. It's a delimiting kind of thing. Whereas the life in the Spirit is hopeful and it's freeing. Very good. Who else? Okay, we have a, we have more, a few more minutes here. <coughs> Reminiscing in Romans. <clears throat> See if this strikes a chord with what we're talking about in chapter 5. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another to him who has been raised from the dead. To what end? In order that we may bear fruit for God. Fruit of the Spirit. Transformation from law to freedom in Christ. In chapter 8 and verse 2, <clears throat> for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And so the end cap verse in Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, is if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep step with the Spirit. Have you ever run a three-legged race where you've got your legs strapped to the leg of another person and you're supposed to run from uh, start to finish? And so you have to have perfect timing with the person that's running next to you because if your timing is ever off, you trip and you fall. Now that's the imagery that this brings to mind of keeping step with the Spirit. Um, and if our senses are not trained to the Spirit, to thinking of things of the Spirit, then we'll be living a life that's out of sync that's, that's awkward and it's, we're stumbling because we're not, we're not focused on the things of the Spirit. If we could do that, if we could focus on the things of the Spirit and walk in step with the Spirit, then a lot of the, the kinds of rules that were imposed by the law of Moses wouldn't be necessary, would they? Because we would instinctively know the things that we should do because our, because our mind has been trained in the, the will of God and the desires of God for us and thinking of things not in fleshly terms any longer of power struggles and, and uh, gaining more for myself but instead our, our, our minds are trained to think about and to be focused on the things where Christ is seated at the right hand of God things that have to do with unity and loving one another and peace and caring about one another and supporting one another, offering each other the help that we have to offer, those kinds of things, then we could say that we were, li that we were keeping in step with the Spirit. This is always the toughest part, isn't it? The applications. Not that we haven't done any. <laughs> Most of what we've been talking about was extremely applicable. But let's come right down to the brass tacks and ask the question that a lot of 
legally minded people may be asking right now, and maybe even if you're not particularly legally minded, you may still have the question, so will God's people obey his commandments or not? And there are some, aren't there? Well, that's a really good question. Because of faith, we will certainly desire to do everything God requires of us, or even wants of us. The ultimate servant would be the one who could anticipate what his master wants and give it to him. I think this is one of the remarkable things that you see in the life of David, how he could even anticipate that God would want a temple. And sometimes we'll do that, and sometimes we will fail. And if we're walking in the Spirit, we'll recognize it as failure. And every day, every day, including today, we will fall short of its intent. You can't be justified by the works of the law, any law, even one you've imposed on yourself. We will fall short of its intent. We never have God's permission to disobey him. <clears throat> Where in the scripture does God ever give us permission to sin? Where? It's not there. We don't have his permission. To the contrary. We're always instructed, consistently instructed against sin. But, justific <clears throat> excuse me, but justification by faith means that when we do what God requires, that will not be the reason we're justified. We're not justified by commandment keeping, we're just, we're rec reckoned as righteous by faith. We are justified because we have faith. We have a relationship with God. It won't be because of what we did. It will be because God chose to be gracious to us. You see, justification is a choice that God makes. It's not something imposed upon him by his own law. And it also means that when we fail, we need not despair. Questions? Comments? Gloria? I would say that as someone who is not just aware, but I'd say painfully aware aware of a time in my life when I did not live in freedom um, and having come to understand the freedom in Christ and live in that, I would never want to go back to the way I was before. I think probably everyone who has experienced freedom in Christ would say the same thing that Gloria just said. Uh, she said she once lived um, as a person who was bound up by all the laws and ordinances and didn't experience true freedom in Christ and that once she has experienced that freedom she has no desire to go back to that kind of legalistic way of thinking. I think perhaps as you grow up from the time you're a child when when you're a child you tend to experience the world more through the eyes of the do's and don'ts, right? Because your parents have to tell you in very simple terms, do this and don't do that. And I think that's kind of what the law of Moses is all about. It's that, it's that tutor that brings us to Christ. But when you grow up, your mom doesn't have to tell you, don't run out in front of track, look both ways before you cross the road anymore. <laughs> Hopefully by the time you get to be 30 or 40, you've figured out that cars are dangerous and that you don't want to step out in a, in a dangerous situation. You might still do it. You might still get hit by a car. Okay? But if you do, it won't be because your mom was 
if you do or if you don't, it won't be because your mom is there telling you look both ways before you cross the street. So the law served the purpose of our mom when we were little. And now that we're grown up, we experience a new kind of freedom <clears throat> that doesn't come through regulations. It comes through a desire to do the right thing. It comes from the desire to, from, from our love for God and our love for other people. Debbie. Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, I, I, you have used two words there together, Debbie, and I would make a contrast between those two, your, those two words. You use the word sadness and despair. And those, are, those to me rep, represent two different levels of... I mean, there's, there's sadness to the point that it corrects you. Godly sorrow works repentance, right? That's, the, that's entirely biblical, 2 Corinthians. But despair means that you're wringing your hands, you're pacing the floor, you have nowhere to turn because of your failure. And that's not true. We don't have to despair because Christ has, Christ has uh, sacrificed for our sin. So we don't need to despair. We don't need to, to be hand wringers. We don't need to be anxious about our failures. We don't need to give up, our, give up on ourselves and just uh, kick ourselves because we have failed. Great. All right, so a new old law in the last few minutes here. <clears throat> There's a tendency for all religious leaders to create a hedge around the Spirit's guidance. That's a, that's a human tendency, and it's true of leaders as it is of all people. It's often done with the best of intentions. It often happens through the elaboration of rules to help people do the right thing, we think. Now, instead of imposing the law of Moses on people, we begin imposing our own law, a law of our own making. And that's where this becomes a topic of, of Galatians chapter 5. When we, take, when we elaborate our own laws and make them equivalent to the law, to, to obedience to Christ. So we should never use our own laws and views as a way of imposing more righteousness on other people. Why? Rules that are imposed, <clears throat> rules are, are imposed that chip away at the freedom of those who walk by faith. This is Galatians 5. Paul teaches in Galatians 5 that this is destruct, detra, detraction from the freedom in Christ in verse 1. It's a hindrance from obeying the truth in verse 7. Ironically, uh, in its unwanted leaven that detracts from sanctity. It's a slippery slope. It is the slipperiest of slopes if we think that, that we can delimit the spirit of Christ by adding rules and guidelines and guards and uh, guardrails. It detract, it's unwanted leaven. And leaven to the Jews meant something that was unwanted because it was impure. So it's not only a slippery slope, there's a, there's, a, there's a loss of sanctity in adding rules beyond what Christ has demanded. And ironically, we often take away people's freedoms when we're concerned about them sliding down a slippery slope. This is when we're most at risk. We think other people are likely to fail, so we put up a guardrail to try to keep them from failing, and when we do that, we, det we detract from their freedom. Laws are well-intended. Rules are well-intended oftentimes. But the effect is not what we think it is. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed have been by the law of Moses. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide in all things written in the book of the law to do them. Galatians chapter 3 verse 10. Conclude by saying, inasmuch as people live by law, their walk of faith is necessarily diminished. Any final comment?
Thank you.